So Lyme disease is caused by um, something called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it's a spirochete, which means a um, corkscrew-shaped bacterium. Um, it has amazing abilities. I'll tell a little bit more about that later. But one of the things it can do by virtue of that um, shape, and because it has an internal flagella, it's inside its skin, so to speak, it can drill through cartilage, tough cartilage and muscle, and it can leave the bloodstream, just go right through the, the vessels and wreak havoc on your body, go all sorts of places. And, you know, at the beginning of this epidemic, more or less, well, we first identified the um, spirochete that was causing problems in Lyme, Connecticut. Um, that was in um, 1983. So we had one species of Borrelia burgdorferi. Over the years, we just have a growing number until in 2017, about 22. Okay, that looks like a nice, neat, you know, progression of um, new species that we frankly have to be concerned about. A lot of these cause illness. So, but the way, there's another way to look at this, and this is where those species were found 13 years ago, where they were found eight years ago, where they're found more or less now. So it's just, this is just a visual way of seeing how complicated this has gotten, where these various species are, many of which we really don't fully understand and know what they're doing. So the world is getting um, more full with more species of Lyme disease. Um, so basically the numbers for the US, we're talking in terms, as, as I said, more than 400,000 cases. In Europe, there's an estimate 650 to 850,000. We know it's in China, we know it's well entrenched in China, but numbers are hard to come by. So this is an old number from one paper that looked at only certain provinces. We know it's bigger than that. In Canada, where I said it's growing, it doubled in the last year, and these are annual figures, by the way. Um, it's, it's still low, but it's not gonna stay that way. So worldwide, we don't really know how big this is, but suffice to say, we're in the millions every year. And all you have to do to know how this is going is to look at the trend. This, reporters love numbers, they love trends. So in the US, in France, it doubled in the last year. In Finland, I spoke in um, Prague recently, so I have some slides from, from Europe. In Poland, the red line is a, uh, an individual state, the, the green line is Poland as a whole. In Canada, it's going up. Okay, so I, um, I call Lyme disease the first epidemic of climate change. And I'm the one who gave it that name. <laughs> I decided that, but it's based on a lot of data, science, information. Um, so how do I defend it? Well, first of all, I have to give you a little bit of a qualifier. Um, climate change did not cause Lyme disease. Lyme disease and ticks have been around for a very long time. So what we're seeing here on the left is this very pretty, very well-preserved tick in amber, which basically is you know, fossilized resin. And uh, a very fortunate scientist by the name of George Pointer found this um, resin in the Dominican Republic. He bought it for a few dollars, brought it back to the United States, cut it up, and found this tick, this beautifully preserved tick. Did some studies. He estimated that this amber was 50 to 20 million years old. Okay, so we got a very old tick. Then he put, it, he put the tick under an electron microscope. And what did he see? Coiled bacteria that we now consider to be the first evidence of Lyme disease. It's been around that long, but it's been living quietly in the environment. 
And, you know, this tells us something, this fossilized tick, tells us how long ticks and Borrelia have been together. They are what one scientist called a, a marvelous uh, example of co-evolution. A tick that is infected with Lyme disease is actually a healthier tick. It has more body fat, which means it can survive harsher conditions longer. It resists drying out. It can quest farther, which means it can search farther and longer for food. That's really important. And oh, by the way, it lives longer than its uninfected brotherhood, which is pretty amazing, this you know, cooperative way in which they have uh, evolved. So I said it's not just climate change that has caused this, that has kind of set these ticks loose and enabled the, path the pathogens they carry. There's a lot of other things going on. Yes, it's climate. It's birds and the way they move things around. It's deer. We have a lot more deer and a lot more small mammals these days. And the reason we have more of those things is because, the way, the way, uh, because of the way that we have managed the environment. You know, we love to live in these beautiful um, suburban ideals with um, our backyards and being close to a little tract of nature and a, uh, a nice um, rail trail or what have you through the woods. But these are not um, natural places. These are adulterated slices of nature. And they actually did studies at um, Cary Institute in Dutchess County in which they measured how many mice you have and how many ticks you have in certain size plots of forest. Long and short, the smaller the forest plot, the more small mammals and more ticks you have. The reason we don't have much biodiversity, we don't have foxes gobbling up those mice, for example. Deer, they don't have any natural predators. And I'll stop here just for a minute. Mice are the, what we quaintly call, the reservoir for Lyme disease. It's one of many reservoirs, but it's the leading one. It's the place where when one of those two to 3,000 eggs hatch into a larval tick, that tick goes for its first of three blood meals. It takes a sip. 90% of the time, it will be infected with Lyme disease. So we have way too many of these mice out there, which is why some of the control of efforts for this epi epidemic are cent centered around the mouse, how we, we will control the mouse population. Okay, so we got forest fragments, we got a perfect storm. Um, right here, I'm just gonna pay homage to scientists um, because they do really great work in trying to figure out what's going on in nature. You know, they, as I said, they climb mountains. Um, they catch um, mice at Cary Institute. They're up to about 400,000 mice that they have caught. And you see on that mouse's ear, there's all sorts of little um, nymphal ticks. Um, they catch birds. Um, one scientific study caught about 3,000 birds at the... Um, along the Gulf of Mexico, basically the southern border of the entrance to the United States, to see how, how many ticks were being um, brought into the United States. And uh, they estimated in the millions. So they, ba they basically count, they snag, they study stuff. 